morning guys um, so we're going to continue on with actually our next chapter uh, our next chapter is going to be on energy uh, we're going to look at concepts of work uh, different types of energy transferring energy from one form to the other uh, towards the end of this chapter here where we're linking a little bit of the momentum stuff again uh, we're going to compare how energy is conserved and momentum is conserved as well in other problems here uh, and then we're going to just do one joint test uh, afterwards so uh, let's just have a look uh, about the same length as the momentum chapter I'll give you a package to practice some of this as well so uh, this is chapter four start a fresh new page uh, sometimes they call it just work and energy I'm just going to call it energy here uh, so a couple of things just right from the start here is I need to define for you um, what is energy. Okay. Now, a lot of us have an intuitive understanding of energy. So if I take a, a box and I lift the box upwards, I've given it some energy. I've taken some of the energy from the food that I've eaten. I've transferred the energy. It's now stored inside that box there. It's lifted uh, above my head here. As I drop that box there, gravity's going to pull it downwards. Uh, it's going to have a very loud sound. Things that have the have energy can actually do work. Things can actually do things when they have energy. So in fact, the more energy something has, the more can go wrong. Uh, so in this case here, we'll suffice with the definition energy, or things that have energy. Uh, they are things that have the ability to do work. They have the ability to do something. Okay? So ability to do work. Uh, some nice things about energy, just right from the start, as we get into this here, energy is a scalar. Right? So scalar meaning it only has the magnitude, it only has the number. Sure, you might still have to have the units, you might still have to have uh, like 15 joules or 2,000 kilojoules or whatnot. But in this case here, because it's not a vector, there's no 2D stuff, there's no components, there's no triangles or anything like that, it's fairly simple. You're just going to have a positive energy for energy that's put in, or if my reaction or if my situation ends up uh, giving off a bunch of energy, like my engine runs on fuel and then uses the energy up to actually travel, uh, that's going to be a negative energy. Yeah, it might still get positive or negative, but it's not going to be applied in any different direction. So right away, we're not going to need to worry too, too much about uh, breaking components up for energy. And I already mentioned here in terms of the units, in terms of the units, we're going to call it the joule. The joule is actually a fairly small unit, so uh, instead what we'll usually use is a kilojoule uh, later on. Uh, the joule, we're going to use capital J for it, and we're going to see that this J here later on will be equivalent to a Newton times meter. Right. Now, that's all the good parts about energy. Turns out, because this is still just sort of uh, bringing our uh, motion study to an end here, we still will need to do some kinematics. We'll still need to do things with velocity, uh, things with momentum, because those ones unfortunately still have direction, like forces on slopes, things like that. We still might need to break up the diagonals for force, but by the time we actually get to the number for energy, that's when we can do scalar, that's when we can do uh, no um, uh, components. Okay? So that's what energy is. Uh, things that have energy can do stuff. Okay, Things that have no energy uh, just sit there, don't really do anything. Uh, I've actually Surprisingly here, I've actually defined for you another term here, work. Uh, specifically in science, work is actually defined in a very specific way as well. Uh, we, again, conventionally, we sort of know, oh yeah, if I drop a box, it had it could do work. Okay, What is it about that dropping motion that actually allows it to do work? There's actually two definitions we're going to work with for work, and we're going to actually use both in formulas. Uh, the first definition here is things that can do work are things that apply a force uh, over a distance. So force applied over a distance. That's what work is. So basically if you have a push or pull and the object actually does move, either you have done work or uh, by burning the fuel in your engine it has done work. Okay. So things that do work, W, this is uh, on your formula sheet here, is the force multiplied by the distance. Okay. But one uh, technical note here we'll see in the first example that we do, the force that we're talking about is the force that's actually causing the distance. Okay, So only the parallel portion. And we'll see in our first example what I mean by that. Okay, So that's the first definition here. Sometimes questions would just ask you that part. Uh, second uh, definition, or just have it uh, since we have it on the board here. Uh, second definition is actually sometimes more useful. Work is defined as a change in energy. So you know how impulse was defined as a change in momentum? If you do work to something, you can actually change the energy of something. Energy is also conserved in the same way momentum was conserved. 
unless you do work, unless you do something to the system, whatever energy that the system had before is going to be the same energy as it afterwards. Just like your momentum, your tendency to stay in one direction, your tendency to keep going and not stop uh, won't change unless you apply an, an impulse, and unless you apply a force over some contact time. So as a change in uh, energy definition here, work is equal to change in energy. Uh, we're going to see today uh, specifically looking at kinetic energy, but that can be generalized to all sorts of different types of energy. Okay, So we're going to start off uh, with the first example here, just looking at let's apply a force in the parallel direction. Uh, let's get this box here actually moving and actually figure out uh, how much work was actually done. Okay, so. Uh, this should be a very uh, familiar problem to you. Uh, we'll do a forces at an angle kind of problem. So let's do here. So we're going to start off here with the box. Let's make this box here. If I can see my numbers better. Uh, let's make my box here 30 kilograms. I'm going to be pulling it up at an angle. Uh, let's pull it up. Just to ensure that it's moving, let's make it um, 400 newtons, and let's apply it at an angle of 10 degrees. I really should try out some of my numbers before we start this. Okay, so we have our mu here. Our mu, I'm going to give it a fairly small mu. Let's give it 0 0.15, right? So there's a setup. Uh, let's do what we're used to doing first, okay? I want you to find uh, find acceleration of the system. So very similar to what we did in chapter 2, but specifically here I'm assuming the numbers all work out. So let's cross our fingers here. Uh, what we want to apply to it as a sort of last step in this is to actually figure out how much work was actually done because I'm going to use the first definition, this force that's being applied parallel is used to actually move it over a distance. I'm actually going to give you a random number as a distance. Let's say I apply this for 20 meters, and I want to know how much work have you done in moving the box over by 20 meters. Okay, So calculate. Actually, there's a couple works that you can do. Calculate the work done by friction. Calculate the work done by your applied force. This is me actually pulling on it. And then calculate the net, which is the overall work. All right. So hoping that my numbers work out here. Let's do our chapter 2 stuff first. Okay. So free body diagram. We have a center of mass. What forces act on this one here is gravity. So we have m times g. I'll label them here. Fg is equal to mg. So 30 times 9.8 gives me here 294. That's how much uh, the Earth is pulling uh, down on this block here. Because my applied force here is applied an angle, so that's 400 newtons, let's figure out how much of it is actually in the x and how much of it is in the y, given that it's at 10 degrees. So I'll call this here fx and fy. fx should equal to 400 cos 10. fy pulling upwards equal to 400 sine 10. Again, hopefully my numbers work out here. I think they should. 400 sine 10 is 69, give or take. And the other one, 400 cos 10 is 394. Okay. So first question you ask yourself here is in the vertical, in the up and down, am I lifting it up hard enough to actually go against gravity? So 69 or 294, well, 294 is bigger. So at least when we look at this picture here in the y direction, so far gravity was trying to pull down 294. By pulling it up at an angle, I apply a Fy of 69. Because I'm just watching this thing here just sitting there, I know that the ground actually supports the difference. The ground pushes a little bit. In this case here, should Fn be smaller or bigger? Hopefully you were able to say smaller here. Because the bird is coming up behind you and actually supplying an extra 69 newtons, the ground, which used to be supplying the whole 294 against gravity, can apply 294 minus that 69. If you like formulas, you can just do a tug of war. It's basically between Fn and Fy. In this case here, those guys are the upwards forces, and they have to counteract gravity, which is the downwards force. You're not going to find this formula anywhere on any formula sheet because it depends on the actual question. So in this case here, our Fn is just going to be the 294 from gravity. I'm going to minus off the Fy over here. So minus off Fy, which is 69. 294 minus 69 gives me 225. And you're going to find whenever we do formulas like this, I already mentioned, you have to look at the free body diagram, you have to see what the teams are, who's fighting against whom. 
In general, when I write Fn and Fy, I treat them as positive values. And that way I don't need to worry about, oh, maybe Fy itself has a negative inside and plus a negative or whatever. If you just treat them all as positive values, when I actually physically minus this over, I know I'm going to take Fg and I'm going to minus off the positive value for Fy here. Right? So just be careful of that here. Just treating things, free body diagram, you can keep everything as positive because the arrows show me which direction uh, things are pulling. Uh, now, the reason why we needed to find our Fn, our normal force, was because our Fn is our apparent weight. It sort of measures how interlocked the grooves are, and that's actually going to tell me something about the friction force that's going against me. So in this case here, let's move along. So the x-axis, this is the more interesting one. I'm not lifting it hard enough to actually lift it off the ground. It's just sliding along the ground. It's like a lawnmower that I'm just, or a cart I'm just pushing along here. I'm still applying an Fx, the horizontal part was a 394, most of it was actually applied uh, just to the right. We're going to calculate what our friction force here. Our friction force always opposes motion, friction just hates what we do. So friction is mu times Fn, the mu I believe I gave you was 0 0.15. Good, multiply by our Fn which we just found was 225. Hopefully, as you're starting to see more of these dynamic problems here, you start seeing some familiarity, uh, getting more practice with it as well. So friction, it's a fairly smooth surface, so friction maxes out, give or take, about 34 newtons against you. Right? So now we ask ourselves here, am I pulling hard enough to actually completely move it? Definitely, because 3 and A4 is bigger than 34. So in this case here, our overall unbalanced force, our net force this time, we're just going to go bigger minus smaller. It's going to be Fx, minus off friction. So I want to color code that there, so that works. So we have a friction force. So that's going to be our 394 minus off the friction force. It maxed out at 34, and that gives me an overall unbalanced force of 360. So that's a force that's being applied to the right, and no one's canceling it. That's actually what's allowing this thing here to actually drag to the right, uh, 360 newtons. Uh, just a quick comment again on Newton's third law. Remember, yes, forces are always equal and opposite. It does not mean 394 has to always be cancelled out by 394. The equal and opposite here deal with each arrow by itself. So if I look at the 394, as I pull up on this handle, as I apply 394, the object is actually pulling 394 against me already. Friction, which is trying to stop the box here, is trying to uh, let the ground here hold the box in place here is 34 backwards. The box is also trying to scrape the ground here 34 forwards. So that equal and opposite uh, feature is still there, but it's not talking about FA has to be equal and opposite with FF. In this case, FA is actually quite a bit bigger, which is why this object here can move. So far, this has been a chapter 2 question. Uh, force at an angle problem, it actually uh, moves over a motion. And now, quite simply, we're going to try to calculate a couple works that are done. We're going to calculate parts that are done by each part separately. Since I already have the net force, let's figure out what's the work done by the net uh, force. In this case here, we're going to use the definition because on this picture, I have a bunch of forces, pushes and pulls, and I also have the distance, the how far it gets, which is the 20 meters. It's actually fairly simple just to go, oh great. The net work is equal to the net force times it by the distance. I found that the net force was 360. That was... Uh, not cancelled out, it's unbalanced force. I multiply it by 20, and we'll end up here, force was in newtons, uh, distance was in meters, 360, again, give or take a little bit of rounding, I'm getting 7,200 joules. Uh, later on, especially when we start, start talking look at temperature, things like that, we know one kilojoule is equivalent to 1,000 joules, so you could similarly call it uh, 7.2 kilojoules if you want. Okay? You can perfectly leave it in joules if you like, but just for practice, just divide it by 1,000. We're actually going to see that this network uh, is actually broken up into two parts. When I applied a force, my force was actually 394. It wasn't just 360. So if I just look at trying to just sort of subdivide this net force, part of this net force was the work done by my applied force. My applied force was used as this box here was dragging along. I'm literally pulling it 394. So if I go 394 multiplied by 20, I'm actually exerting more work than what's overall that's done to the system. I'm actually doing 7880 joules. Why is my net work? Why is my overall uh, task only 7200? It's because my net, for, uh, my net work 
is actually going to be subtracted by friction. Not only am I, 394, pulling it over this 10, uh, uh, 20 meters worth of distance, friction is also going 34 against you. A little bit later, it's going 34. A little bit later, it's going 34. Friction is constantly, it's also parallel to motion, even though it's being dragged to the right, friction is trying to drag it to the left. Friction is trying to oppose you, so this is the work done just by the friction part. Friction force is a vector, so we need direction. So friction maxes out at a negative 34, multiply it by that same 20, 34 times 20 gives me 680. And if you have a look at these two numbers here, you take 7880, you minus off 680, that should give you back the very same 7200 that we get. Okay. So especially when you're dealing with your forces, when you're dealing with what your net force is, who's the unbalanced force, whatnot, they might just be asking you, well, what's the overall? Okay. Yeah, 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 I know friction is going to get rid of some of that work. Some of that work will be wasted. What's the overall that's done? Sometimes they're going to ask you the bits. When you apply the force, you actually put in 7880. Friction got rid of 680. Maybe that was the lost uh, energy due to uh, friction. It's going to heat up as it scrapes along the surface. And overall, we just get 7200. One other comment before we leave this uh, problem here. You'll notice I've been saying I'm using 394. In reality, I actually supplied a little bit more than 394. I actually pulled 400. How come this 69 part wasn't actually included? That's actually back to our definition here. Because work is defined as the parallel part, it's the force that's actually causing a distance. When you actually supplied the 69 in the vertical, we were not lifting it hard enough to physically cause it to pop off the ground. That's why this part here doesn't count. So in fact, yes, we are pulling diagonal 400, but it's just the horizontal part that actually ends up mattering. So on that note there, we've shown you an example of when you apply work, when you apply forces over distance, how you calculate the, uh, the work done. Uh, there's a few situations where work is not done. Okay, So let's start off here. Work is not done if, okay, I'll give you a couple, just looking at that formula, work is equal to force times distance, a few situations. First situation, that's the part that we can ignore that vertical part. Work is not done if force is applied uh, not in the direction of motion. Okay, sorry, double negative there. So, but basic idea here, I have a box like this, okay? In our question, when I applied a force that's diagonal, there was an upward component. There was an FY component. But all that we saw for the box is the box ended up going this way. Because this one here is actually perpendicular to the motion, the FY isn't causing the motion. You might tire yourself out by trying to hold on to this cart here, by trying to support it against gravity. But because the FY is not directly causing this motion here, your work is right away going to be zero. It's only the FA part the parallel part that actually, the part that causes motion that actually counts. So same thing here, when you actually push against it, you'll see that in the next example. If, if force is applied, but there's no motion. So why might that be? It could be a more complicated situation. Let's actually do the easier one first. Let's say I have a box that's sort of supported against a wall. I'm physically supplying a force and I'm allowing it to have enough friction to go against gravity so that this object can just stay against the wall as long as I'm holding it. I'm applying a force. I might tire myself out by holding this one here. But in this case here, if you look at your formula, work is equal to force times distance. Again, because your force is perpendicular, the distance it hypothetically could travel is up and down. Because the force is not actually causing any motion, your D is actually zero. Again, notice I'm saying you are going to tire yourself out. Right? It's going to feel like you've done a lot, but at least in science here, because there's been no motion on the object, we know that no work overall is done. Now that's sort of the perpendicular case like we just mentioned. It could be the case where we have constant velocity. Remember, constant velocity doesn't necessarily have to mean zero. So constant velocity means maybe it's going 10 meter per second, a little bit later it's over here, a little bit later it's over here. We knew from our forces chapter that means your net force was zero. It doesn't mean that I couldn't have applied a force. I could actually be pushing it, let's say, 5 newtons. Let's say there's enough wind against me that goes 5 newtons. Well, again, your net force is actually zero. My force is not actually used to actually cause that motion because your net force is also zero, so your work is also zero. Okay. Sorry, I actually meant to uh, include that as your third step, so let's actually copy that down here. 
So let me just clarify. That's our third situation. Um, so we are applying, um, you could be applying an external force, but the motion just continues constantly. Uh, remember, constant velocity means that there's no acceleration. And from Newton's second law, that means there's no net force. So in that case there, uh, there's no overall work done. So if the object moves at constant velocity, if it's not uh, speeding up or slowing down, uh, no work has been done as well. At least no net work. If I compare it back to the earlier question, you might be tiring yourself out. You might be going, let's say, 7880. But there's enough of an against you force, also negative 7880. So overall, your net work will be zero. Right? So notice that sort of conventionally we're saying, yeah, you're going to tire yourself out. But because uh, of this distance aspect, the object had to have gone somewhere. Uh, we actually use that uh, as our scientific definition. Right? So uh, that's our first definition. Work is just force times distance. Just to get us a little bit into the second definition, most of our chapter will be using the second definition. Uh, we're going to specifically be looking at work is also a change in energy. I like this next question because you can actually analyze it using it both definitions, and then we're going to switch over to uh, using change in energy for future problems. So just recap from last week. I introduced this to you here, kinetic energy. Uh, this is the energy that moving objects have, so energy of motion. And we already used the formula a couple times with elastic, uh, inelastic collisions here. The kinetic energy, you can say E subscript K or just KE. If it's sim simpler for you, it's equal to a half mv squared. All right. So basically what's happening here is, depending on your mass, uh, if I manage to move a heavy object, a heavy object moving will have more kinetic energy than a lighter object. This is where we get rid of that um, vector problem. Velocity is actually a vector. That part there could be positive or negative. If I take a positive or negative number square, it just becomes positive. That way, this one here can just be a scalar. So uh, although when we're dealing with the motion part of the problem, we still need components and things like that, once we get to the energy, we're just going to go simple plus and minus. So let me just make sure I can verify for you where did this formula come from. Uh, make sure that the work formulas are actually consistent. So just as a quick aside here, Let's start off with the definition. So work, just scientifically, is defined as you apply a force over a distance. Okay, You push, uh, and it, the object actually moves. Uh, on the side here, we're going to use formulas that we know. Let's say F net is equal to ma. Right? So Newton's second law. Whenever you apply a force, I can actually write ma for that. I see an F right here. You never need to repeat this definition, but I'm just going to show you where this comes from. So you have double w is equal to m times a times d. And what I'm going to focus on is I'm going to focus on this a times d part. We've actually seen that part using one of our kinematic formulas. We had v squared is v naught squared plus 2ad. That's where ad shows up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate for ad. I'm going to bring the v naught squared over. v squared minus v naught squared. I need to divide the half over as well. So let's divide the half. That's equal to ad. Say it another way, wherever I see AD, I can actually punch in this expression. I see an AD right there, so I'm going to punch it into the right there. So now I took the definition for work. Work is equal to force times uh, distance. So mass is still out here. I'm just going to copy in green what I put in. A half V squared minus V naught squared. And then if I just sort of punch the terms in, just scale the M in and scale the half in, I'm going to get 1 half M. So try to color code these for you here. mv squared minus 1 half. I'm distributing that half and the m in, and we end up with 1 half mv squared in both cases. So this is actually where we came up with the formula. Let's call this kinetic energy. And because this deals with final velocity, this is ke final. Let's call this initial velocity. That's where that half showed up. That's where the mv squared uh, formula shows up. So therefore, I can write at least w is equal to change in kinetic energy. So basically, framing it as a half mv squared is ex essentially saying the same thing, but it's quoted in terms of a kinetic energy concept. Uh, with the next question, you can see we can do it with our kinematic stuff. Uh, later on uh, in tomorrow's lesson, we're going to see problems that kinematics sort of fails us. At least this energy part here still works. Right? So, um, let's finish off with another question here. Let's start off with a 50 kilogram car moving at 25 meter per second comes to stop 
over 75 meters. Okay, so very slow, like step on the brakes. Uh, I want you to tell me here, calculate the friction force. Calculate the net force. Okay. I'm going to do this using energy uh, first, and then uh, we'll match it up uh, using our kinematic stuff just to verify. Okay. So as always, I like starting off with a picture. So we start off with a 50 kilogram car. It currently is moving, and it's going 25 meter per second. Notice we're not accelerating, so there's actually no FA. What we know is this one here is going to come to a stop. So a little bit later, it's going to be at 0 meter per second. It's going to be at rest, and it actually took 75 meters worth of ground, positive, to actually uh, bring you to a stop. The only way this happens is for you to step on the brakes. When you step on the brakes, you're applying an FF. Like I said, we're not accelerating anymore. Even though we did have a forward velocity to start off, we're actually not having an FA. So the FF is actually our net force in this picture. Sure, we still have an FG keeping us on the ground. We still have the ground supporting us. But those ones there are not in the direction of motion. So we're just considering uh, the FF part of it. Right. So uh, let's use energy first, because this is actually going to be an easier calculation for us. So the work we just derived here, work is defined as a change in energy in general, because we're dealing with motion to no motion, so change in kinetic energy. Let's try half mv final squared minus half mv initial squared. So we go half, 50, at the end I'm not moving, minus half, 50, at the beginning I was 25. Double check your units are the correct ones as well. In this case here, no surprise, when I'm not moving I have no kinetic energy. 0.5 times 50 times 25 squared gives me 15, 625. So to keep that whole number for now, eventually you want to convert that to um, 2 or 3 sig figs. And notice that it's a negative. I thought we said energy was supposed to be a scalar. Why is there negatives? In this case here, it's negative, yes, because the force of friction is sort of in the backward direction. But the negative actually means something different for uh, energy terms. The negative actually means energy lost to surroundings. So the car used to have all this moving energy, actually exactly 15,625. By stepping on the brakes, I lost this energy to the environment. I lost it due to heat. I lost it due to sound. You might hear the screeching of the brakes, things like that. I had to have removed 15,625 from the system. So therefore, I end up with zero energy. For me to have conservation energy, someone else had to have picked up this 15,625. Basically, I'm down 15,000 joules. And then someone else is up by 15,000 joules. Uh, although I did find the work uh, using the change in energy formula, just like with our impulse formula, once you find work, you can go back and find force times distance, right? We have two formulas for work, right? Either do energy change or do force times distance. Now, if I'm supposed to be losing 15,625, I don't know what my net force is. Remember, the only force, even though I was going forwards, there's no applied force trying to speed me up. This F is actually going to be FF. I multiply it over a distance of 75, and voila, we have negative 15,625 divided by 75 gives me 208 newtons. Right. So that's the energy way of solving it. Right. You can practice. Uh, let's just uh, do it with the kinematics way of solving it. You can equally well do this using the energy way or using the kinematics way. Right. So let's just verify that everything's consistent. You saw in a derivation we used a kinematic formula, so it should come out okay. But how we would do using kinematics here, just do one or the other. Uh, I might want to find the acceleration first. So I would probably do v squared equals v naught squared plus 2ad, which our formula did use for us. Our final velocity is 0. Square it. Starting speed was 25 squared plus twice. I don't know the acceleration, but I know it took 75 to slow us down. So 0 is equal to 25 squared, 625. Added to 150 times a. Uh, 150 times a is negative 625. The acceleration is uh, 4.2, negative meter per second squared. Acceleration is still a vector. Acceleration is still is being applied. The velocity was going forwards, but the acceleration is supposed to be going backwards. Whenever those are opposites, I slow down. And now I can just verify here, well, if my f net is just friction in this case, and it's equal to ma, let me actually do it this way here, uh, m times a, it's just friction this time. That's what I'm asked to do. I have 50 kilograms. That's how interlocked they are. Minus off by 4.2 should give me the same force here times 50. Oops. 
4.2 times it by 50 gives me uh, 210. Okay, so give or take a little bit of rounding. There's the kinematic way of doing it. All right, so at least in this question here, I showed you it's possible to do both ways. Uh, we're going to see starting in tomorrow's lesson, um, you might be able to do just energy and kinematics doesn't work, or you might be able to do just kinematics and energy doesn't work. Basically, we're coming up with many different ways of solving the problem uh, and going from there. So I'm going to leave you with this one question here just for your practice. Okay. Probably not as hard as the one that we just did there. Because work is only the parallel part due to motion, I'm going to leave you with just a, a ramp problem just to try out here. Uh, let's say I have this ramp here. Uh, let's make this here a 40 kilogram object. Hopefully this brings back uh, good memories, uh, 60 degrees. Uh, I'll let you do the forces diagrams and all that. So uh, fine the acceleration of the system. And B, I'm going to give you that this object here ends up sliding downwards. So I propped it up. At first it was at rest. I'm going to let it fall downwards and it's going to fall down by 30 meters. Okay. I want you to calculate for me here. Calculate the work done, again, same thing, by uh, friction. Okay, I'm going to give you a coefficient in a second here. Uh, calculate the work done by gravity. Careful, it's just going to be the down part. So it's just going to be F down. And then calculate the overall and the net overall. Okay. Uh, let's do a coefficient of friction here. Let's make it see mu is 0 0.10. Okay. So part A is going to be very similar to your force stuff. Uh, you do free body diagrams. Careful, when we do come to this uh, work here, work is equal to F times D, but it is only the parallel part. So friction, which will eventually be upwards, that's parallel. F down, which is sliding it downwards this way, will also be parallel. It's only those parts that matter. The F G in and the F n might help you find the friction force, but those ones there are not applied. Those are perpendicular. So in that case, there is not going to count. Okay, so I'll leave it for you there. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, guys.